two voices in a room, but it grew to be more. We had barely met, but we fell deep during our late-night telephone calls. I once moved 800 miles to a city where I had no job and didn't know anyone beside my fiancé, a man with whom I had spent less than three weeks in person. But he lived in Fort Collins, Colorado. I lived in Las Vegas, and we met on a trail in Utah's capital, Rip National Park, where both of us had gathered with friends. The trail was actually a steep, fast, fast creek. Once you scrambled to the bottom, you needed a second car to retrieve the car left at the starting point. Our two groups each had one car, so we joined up at the top. He was a physics professor with big brown eyes, long eyelashes, a shy green, and his outfit matched mine. Same loose the khaki short brown pullovers, uh, beige t-shirts, black hiking sandals, we started working together, talking nonstop and ignoring our friends. Turns out we had been to some of the same mountains and knew some of the same people despite never having lived in the same state. We were familiar strangers. I helped him at a steep spot when he stumbled, but he didn't get embarrassed like many men would if they fell in front of a woman they were flirting with. But he was just comfortably himself, including some clumsiness, which I think is remarkable and rare. At trail's end, we sat close while our friends left to get the other vehicle. The desert was hot and silent around us. He smiled, I smiled, and moved closer, thinking we should kiss. But he didn't take the bait. Instead, he got in, in his group's car and left without asking for my number. Later, though, he tracked down my address and wrote me a letter. My dating profile said I was over 30, worked as a field biologist, wanted a serious relationship, and loved children and hiking in remote places. Man after man had responded by saying they wanted hot mountain honey like me for casual good times. None mentioned the children and most seemed unfamiliar with the concept of hiking. Marty's letter said he had been reluctant to reach out for a potential relationship that would be long distance, but decided to anyway because he was amazed that two people who met randomly could connect so easily. Like me, he wanted children and a serious relationship. He sounded great, but I was afraid to hope. I had plenty of disappointment involving men who started hot and cooled while I pined over them. The uncertainty kept me alert and determined to prove myself worthy of their love. I had also pushed away some good guys thinking I'd rather reject them first since any decent man would surely reject me once they knew my flaws. Such was my confidence. But Marty's letter, I read it again and again, then called. Well, how about it, he said. He wanted me to visit. His blunt delivery freaked me out. 
and I got scared and declined. I was accustomed to men who played games. In the silence that followed, we might have hung up and ended contact right there, but we had liked each other when we met, and the pawn was a safe the space. So we start, restarted the conversation and began what would rapidly become a relationship. Most couples say distance is a problem, but it helped us. We couldn't see each other, be distracted by other activities or people, or be consumed by sex. We only had our voices, and a voice in a dark room at night with the pawn pressed against your ear is intimate. At the same time, a pawn can be a screen to hide behind that whenever you feel too exposed. We spilled the secret that would have been hard to tell face to face. I came clean about my recent breaking up, break up with my living boyfriend. We didn't just grow apart, but had the screaming battles in which we said horrible unforgivable things. Marty admitted that his ex had dumped him. It wasn't mutual after all. We both said we were sick of pretending casual relationship were enough. We didn't have to say we were lonely. I tried telling myself that this was only a pawn thing, that I wouldn't be heartbroken if it didn't work out, but when it traveled to a friend's wedding, it occurred to me that it might admit someone new there. My relief when he kept the calling made me wonder how attached I was becoming to a man I'd met only once. He never repeated his invitation to visit. Part of me went into a mild panic, even though I knew we were becoming more intimate, not less. Anyway, when a man in Las Vegas asked me out on a day trip to the mountains, I said yes, looking way older than his profile description. He hopped a few hundred yards of a hill his lips are turning blue. When they became purple, I suggested we starve.